I'm Matt Jolly, and this is History Worth Saving. Coming to you from the Red Barn at Fairchance Farm in Georgia, where great American stories grow strong. Welcome to the third season. Please, if you would, sign up for the newsletter at historyworthsaving.com. I'd love to stay in touch. And remember, if you like the show, tell your friends. If you don't, (laughs) well, bless your heart. Thanks for listening. Now, here's the show. On this episode of the History Worth Saving podcast, we're talking to friend and author, Dr. Elise Wheeler. She spent her life devoted to science. Her undergrad, molecular biology, when she went to grad school, it was medical lab sciences, you know, the easy stuff, right? Underwater basket weaving just was not in her wheelhouse. Her PhD, human physiology and biophysics, she went on to have a career not only working in the laboratories at hospitals, but also managing labs. Dr. Wheeler, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. We've heard a lot about labs this year coming out of uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And we're, well, we're still seeing the effects of Delta. This is something that, uh, that you used to study. And once you retired from all of that, you chose a career writing fantasies the foxhaven chronicles are up right now there's two of them i just think it's i just think it's so fantastic that someone so devoted to science now writes about cats and people who can pass through walls and all of these crazy characters i wanted to have you on to talk about this stuff because i think it's great right now before we get into fiction though let's talk about science The superheroes in all of this right now seem to be, and in some cases, the villains, depending on which side of the fence you're on, which uh, which stories you're reading, are these lab scientists. Can you talk to us a little bit about this and and maybe help boil down what we've been reading about in the news uh, for the last, uh, well, really, I guess, 17, 18 months now? I think one of the things that's disturbed me with the way that the misinformation is getting out there is the idea that the vaccines, specifically the Moderna and the Pfizer, that are mRNA vaccines, are have been rushed, that they're new, and they're not. We've been studying the DNA sequence since it was discovered back in the 50s, and every year there's more and more information about how, how our DNA works, how the DNA communicates throughout the cells with molecules like the messenger RNA, which is what mRNA stands for, and how it produces the proteins that produce life. And the mRNA from the virus is just that. It's a little message that says, oh, I'm going to make this spike protein that sticks out. And that's what our immune system sees and reacts to and says, this is foreign, therefore I need to make an antibody to it. And it's not new. We've been doing this, like I say, for many, many, many years, and there's a huge body of knowledge about using mRNA technologies to develop viruses, to develop vaccines to viruses. Um, In the laboratory, specifically the clinical laboratories and the uh, professional labs such as LabCorp, the the technologists at the bench are able to use this science to diagnose diseases, to recommend uh, therapies for specific diseases, particularly in the world of cancer research. And, you know, this is This is the embodiment of where the beauty of science is going. And, of course, you've left all that behind now to write about fantasy (laughs) and fiction, which I I just think is great. You know, I just imagine what's the the old uh, the old joke when you live around Washington, D.C., like we have so many years in and out of there. You hear a joke about all these three letter agencies. And one of my favorites is the NSA. They say, you know how you tell an extrovert? from an introvert at the NSA. And, and the, the punchline is, you know, the extrovert looks at other people's shoes. So here are these labs filled with people that I would imagine just sort of keep to themselves and they do their work and they're very procedurally oriented. And then when you leave, you have these unbelievable passions that you've had pent up for 30, 40 years, however long you're in the, <laughs> and then you just go, you go run wild. And here you are now an author of two books, uh, the Fox Haven Chronicles, which they're the largest books I think I've ever attempted to read. 
<laughs> well, obviously, you're not a, a fantasy reader because no, that is no, the, I'm not. At least you know me. <laughs> you know me. That, that is the length of a of, of book. You know, 120 pages. Uh, that that's the length of books that. Uh, I'm sorry, 400 pages. That's the length of 120,000 words is what I was trying to say. That's I'm thinking 125 of pages with a few pictures. I'm in. Yeah, but, no, yeah. but 400, 450 pages. That is what a, a typical fantasy or science fiction reader wants because they want you to build a complete world. They want to understand everything about where are your characters and, and what's happening to them. So that's a very common um word length or, or page length for a fantasy reader. But let me back up just a minute, because when I went to my undergraduate at Vanderbilt University, I started out thinking about becoming an English major and becoming a writer. So it was back in my you know, late teens, early 20s. And science was easier. And your father, <laughs> your father was a, was a medical doctor, wasn't he? He was a physician. He was an MD, PhD. And he he's actually like, had look. His, yeah, and he was t telling me that the, the world of research is is a tough world, and for me to think seriously, uh, you know, about what I wanted to do. To be honest, the science courses were fascinating to me, and therefore something that I pursued in the English courses. As much as I loved writing, even back then, I could not see the, the I couldn't see it a paycheck, and I guess that I was I was being pragmatic. I, I couldn't see the paycheck, and I loved the science. You know, I took so math. Right. It's so it's so, you know, illogical to, to become a writer. Right. Because you're dealing with everything that is so subjective. And I know that I quote him often on this show, but, but Tony Bennett, he says there's two types of music. There's good and there's bad. And right. I think writing's the same way, but it's still it's there's a lot of subjective stuff in there. I mean, how do you know if it's good? to It might not be good to someone else if it's good to you. So, well, yeah. and, and beyond beyond that, whether it's good or not, is it marketable? A lot of the classics that we think about nowadays in terms of writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway and so on did not necessarily uh, have a lot of financial success you know, while they were alive and while they were writing. And so it is, it's a very precarious um, a career and only a few break in, only a few become you know, uh, Dan Brown or any of those sorts of folks. But so coming out of science, and I'm, I'm not entirely out, I'm still an educator, so I'm still involved with, with the training of the next generation of medical laboratory science, scientists, but coming out of the science and into the world of fantasy is not that far a leap because guess what? We ask the same questions. Science is based on asking what if, and fantasy is based on what if. You know, Stephen King says, create your characters and then throw them into a situation and see what happens. And in the laboratory, both research, no, but not in the clinical lab so much, but in the research laboratory to develop good clinical laboratory tests, we ask, what if we put these two components together and see what happens? So scientists, and there's many, many, many scientists who've become writers as um Isaac Asimov was a PhD in biochemistry, and yet he wrote voluminous um, material on science fiction. And if you want to know what the world's going to look like in 20 years, read science fiction now, and you'll see. Jules Verne. Jules Verne wrote in the 1850s, and he wrote about submarines that I could know. go around One the world. One of my favorites. I mean, how could you not love a little Jules Verne in your life? Absolutely. And look at the physicians, Michael Crichton writing the Andromeda strain mm. and several others. He was a Harvard trained physician and yet he never practiced medicine. He left medicine after he got his degree to go into writing a basically science fiction. And to me, science fiction and, and science fantasy are, are very similar. Yeah, I, I read them and I go, oh, my goodness, do I really want to do that or do I want to get back in my box with history worth saving? And a lot of times I want to get back in my box with, with history worth saving. <laughs> so I, I don't mind that. What, what are you having to drink today? I'm having I've got a little beverage here. What do you what do you what are you sipping? On I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't tea? have done. No, no, no it's unsweet on. tea. Oh, no, come I don't, you're never going to make it as a southern writer, <laughs> Elise, if you don't. 
<laughs> you don't sit back with some sweet tea or something. Come on. Well, I grew up drinking sweet tea, but again, studying um, the human body and understanding what things do to it, having that much sugar just doesn't set well with me anymore. <laughs> sound like somebody else in this house. <laughs> Dr. Wheeler. All right. So the Foxhaven Chronicles, the second book is now out and it's available on your website, which is foxhavenchronicles.com at Amazon and all over the place. You can buy uh, these books. You you describe them as cozy. Give, give me the, the genre that these fit into. Well, the, the, the two are companion volumes. They're not necessarily um, what, because the first of the Foxhaven Chronicle is called Raven's Eye, and it, it is really the uh, paranormal adventure uh, that is the, the, the underpinning of the Foxhaven Chronicles. And the second volume hopefully will be out early next year. The, the uh, Waterton Zoo is a companion to it in that one of the main characters is related to a character in the Raven's Eye, but it is meant to be kind of a tongue-in-cheek, quicker read um, and I call it a cozy fantasy because if you're familiar with the genre cozy mystery the cozy mystery always never has the dead body anywhere in the scene somebody's been killed or kidnapped or something off camera and then the um, mystery is resolved by a librarian with a cat or with somebody with a dog and but it's it's not violent you know the the reader can kind of skim through it pretty quickly and just enjoy the, the ride um waterton zoo is kind of based on the old television show nick and nora remember the two detectives that used to tongue, uh, talk very tongue-in-cheek with each other you know it was slick and it was funny and that's more of what waterton zoo is all about except it does have gargoyles and trolls and a demon you know a few things like that just to make it fun just kind of thrown in there and and did you co-author this as well with your with your writing partner with, uh, with yes Carolyn? yes carolyn houghton and i've been friends since we were eight years old and we have had a similar pathway in terms of what we like to read and that's one of the things about writing fantasy is you have to enjoy reading it as well. I mean, you've got to be well-versed in what's out there. And Carolyn and I have um, created the characters. We kind of share the characters back and forth. Um, the only rule that we have is that you can't kill off somebody else's character. Without their knowledge and consent. <laughs> because you have a consent. lot of characters. You have like, a, I mean, there are, a, there are a ton of characters in your books. Have you lost count or do you know? There are 12 main characters in the book and that is based on the fact that the, one of the premises of the book is that each of these individuals comes from a different spiritual background a different cultural background and each of them sits in a different position on the medicine wheel and the medicine wheel you can think of it like the face of a clock so there's 12 positions on the medicine wheel and each character comes with a strength or an understanding or they have denied their cultural and spiritual heritage. And in the course of the story, they have to embrace it in order to recover their lost um, manager who's been kidnapped. See, I think all of this started when you were at one of those whiz wheels in the lab and you said, you know, what if, <laughs> what if one day I write this book? And it's great. And so look, if you, if you want to check this out again, we're going to quick link the show stories uh, we'll have the links in there, but foxhavenchronicles.com. Then also, there, there's some information about you available at the Carrollton Writers Guild website, which is just carrolltonwritersguild.org. This is our Southern Writers Guild, and it is right. a fine one. It really is a fine one, and I would encourage anybody in Georgia to come and join it. I get there when I can, uh, which, is, which is not as often as I should, but we're lucky in, in the town of Carrollton, Georgia to have this writers guild and it really is it's 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 everything that you would think of in a good southern writers guild there's poets there's 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 plenty of authors some write about stuff that that is so far out there uh like Elise but but it's it's still good <laughs> and then there's Frank who has been on this show Frank Allen Rogers who I think is a fine author writes westerns and rodeo romances and good stuff like that that's just uh enjoyable to read uh, from so many different levels. And then we have poets. We have some celebrated poets. And, and it, it, it rounds it out, I think. 
Um, it does. And I would put a plug in for anyone who wants to write. Uh, we often get the image of the writer having being solitary, you know, sitting in a room all by themselves. But the reality is if you want your writing to progress, if you want your writing to become better, share it. You need to be sharing it with people of like mind, people who are also struggling with learning how to not write in a passive voice or learning how to make the character come alive by using all five senses. And I would encourage anyone to find yourself a writer's group of like-minded people. Uh, my writing has improved tremendously by sharing it with folks that can give me good critique. And they've asked me to stop coming as often because mine just hasn't <laughs> improved <laughs> to the point that they would like. So, but no, it's a fun, fun group. And, you know, the, the great thing about a, a Southern Writers Guild, and I keep saying that, because how many, how many seersucker suits did we have show up at our, at our dinner the other night? I, I, maybe one. <laughs> no, no, there were more okay, suits. Yes, but there were several more jackets. I, I it, yes. that was a fantastic dinner, and and it really was wonderful that they that they put that on for all of the the folks who had published a book in twenty twenty and twenty twenty one. And yeah, uh, it and was I, just terrific to be there. I I don't want to give anybody the impression that they have to be a, a Southern writer, end quote, because over half of our group are displaced Northerners who've come down here to get away from the snow. You know, we have and a term for that, but I'm not going to say it on this show, at least. <laughs> and, that, and that's a, it's a benefit to the group <laughs> in that we all come from a variety of backgrounds and perspectives. But my point in and, this is, is get out there and join the one in your area if you, if you have a desire to write, because that's the important takeaway here. Yep. And you see, it's interesting what nothing that you've done in your life is ever a waste because we have two authors that are that write thrillers. They write mysteries and thrillers. And every now and then they'll come up and they'll say something that from my experience in the laboratory and in clinical medicine, I can say, wait a minute, that's not that wouldn't go that way. So as much research as they do on the Internet, they find that sometimes my background helps them to make the blood spatter look better <laughs> well there you go and you you bring up a good point it's never too late either if you want to write uh just get out there and start writing that's the hardest part in all of this and one of the things when i when i love i love having authors on because they all they, everybody says the same thing it's it's the hardest part of 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 writing a book is writing the book is just sitting down and doing and you don't think that that would be that difficult but it is how do you get around that and that's not writer's block. It's just the no, it's, discipline it's, of it, doing it. I mean, how do, you, just, how do you do it? It's just getting your rear end into the chair is, is often a lot of the problem because life gets in the way. You know, you have, you have a, a guild meeting, you have exercise to go do, you've got a fixed dinner, whatever. And I think a lot of the discipline of it is even if you're not inspired, sit down and write a sentence. And you may throw that sentence away, but just the mere act of getting those words on the screen or on a piece of paper will stimulate your thoughts to go further. Um, I am not disciplined enough that I write X number of words every day, which a lot of, of authors will tell you you have to write every day, but I do try to get enough done in a week that I feel that my story is moving forward. And of course, I'll admit that I'm one of those people that my characters talk to me in my head, so if I don't get it down on paper, they're going to nag me. You know, They want the next scene to come out because your characters become very real to you. As you were writing, I'm sure you found that when you wrote your short stories. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I knew them all. That was the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I understand where you're going with that. And it it's so true that a great character will just kind of jump out from the page. And I, I think, yeah. you know, with your book and you said you have 12 characters, how how many supporting characters are in your book? Because I've lost count. Oh, there are probably eight or maybe nine supporting characters that have, you know, uh, walk-ons or th things like that. But that is part of the beauty. Working with another person to write a book is, is very challenging because you want the book to have a single voice. You don't want the reader to, to be jarred back and forth between the voices of two different authors. Carolyn and I fortunately work very smoothly together, but it was a lot of fun because about half the characters are hers. She created them. Half the characters are mine. I created them. And we could often sit down and have a conversation, kind of role-playing as w if we were those characters and testing out what would they say, how would they react. And, and that was a lot of the fun of doing this as a collaborative project. 
And and you've known each other since childhood, which is 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 one of the great things about it. Raven's Eye, uh, which I've gotten through and I enjoyed, is a book where I think that is I think it sort of comes into its own there with your relationship with Carrollton and that childhood friendship. Because I don't think you could co-write a book like that unless you had known the person as long as the two of you have known each other. I just don't think it's possible. I, I think it, it would be very difficult, partially because when, when we disagreed, we had all of that friendship to fall back on and work, work out any disagreement that we might have. What are you working on now? Um, I'm working on two things. Number one, Carolyn and I are working on the second volume in Foxhaven, which is called Wolsey. And I'm just about to finish a young adult novel that has to do, at working title is Mariah and the Mule. Mariah is a young girl who happens to be a troll, and her family is caught in the fairy world because of a earthquake that has uh, shut off all of the passes through the mountains. And Mariah is growing up uh, with her parents. Her father is a blacksmith, and she's learning how to become a blacksmith. And she gets involved with a runaway from the royal court who happens to be a young Pegasus. I've had that happen before. It's a nasty <laughs> business, but you get through it, you know? <laughs> Every day. But this is, <laughs> this is a young adult. I, young adult, I say, middle school, you know, um, what, 11 to, 11 to 14 sort of yeah. age group. But I'm finding that most of my adult friends in the Writers Guild are fascinated by the story, too. So they're having a good time. How are your problems different today than they were 20 years ago? My problems as in... The day-to-day. I mean, you go to work and you sit down in your computer and you're not worried about, I guess, lab testing and if it's going to go correctly and who ordered the Petri dishes. I mean, I don't know. I'm just making this up. But how how are your problems different today? Was one worse than the other or are they both sort of the same? No, I am thoroughly enjoying retirement. Believe me, I am busier now than I was. I mean, I worked, I worked long, long hours. Um, I had a $30 million budget that I managed in one of the hospitals. So a lot of my concern was, was um, spreadsheets and, you know, staffing. Staffing is always a problem because these are professions that are, that are not advertised. I mean, we see the, the nurses and the doctors on the front lines, and that's what everybody thinks about. And you made a good point. M- medical laboratory scientists are often introverts. They're much happier back in their laboratories and doing their testing. Um, so I would say that that world was challenging on a 7 by 24 basis. Hmm. Writing is a 7 by 24 occupation as well because you're always thinking about it. You're always plotting. You're always figuring out the next twist to keep the reader turning the page. Um, but I love what I'm doing now. I love the writing. Um, and, and it's an escape, you know, escaping into another world. And But they're still very real people to me, and they have very real motivations and very real weaknesses and foibles. And escaping has been something so needed for the last 18 months, 19 months, better part of two years, it seems like, with the pandemic people have been isolated they've been at home they've been working from home they've been consuming books and audio books and video i mean at a voracious pace how have you kept up with that as a writer you know when you sit when when i think about writing the next scene in the book um it's it's like opening the page of a book that i'm going to read that i didn't write um and and what i mean by that is It's an exploration. It's a, um, gee, what's today going to hold? Um, And it's a a very positive thing. And it's it's one of the things that stops me from what they're now calling doom scrolling, you know, where you go through Facebook and you go through all of these news sites and all you can read about is how many cases and how many people died and how many people aren't getting vaccinated when all of the science behind it says that the vaccine is the right thing to do. Um, so for me, it's a matter of saying, okay, I, I'm going to sit down here for an hour or two hours and get into the world that has a positive outcome, that has people that are trying to do their very best and a little bit of humor, you know, a little, little bit of a, a joke here and there, something like that. <laughs> but it is a case of being able to close the door and say the, the other world, the real the world that I'm living in doesn't exist for the time that I can be in this other world. And that's what I hope it'll do for the readers, that they can, they can put aside 
you know, some of the concerns that, that have plagued us, no, no pun intended there, but, um, and, and for a few minutes at least escape into a, another world and another sensory experience. My friend James always tells me, he says, you know, you, you can choose to not live in reality, but you can't escape the consequences of reality. <laughs> and I love yes. that. I mean, I <laughs> used to tell his kids that and I, you know, I just, it, it's, it's, it's a loving thing to say to someone who, who's not maybe, uh, you know, living entirely in reality and you've made a retirement out of this, but I, I know you are still so grounded in science. In your opinion, where are we regarding the pandemic? I mean, it's 2021, we're recording this in August, but where, where are we in this from a we science are, perspective? Let's just say that. We are not out of the woods yet, and, and that's a cliche, I know, but the reality is we are never going to get this pandemic down to what we should say is an endemic level, like the flu or like the common cold, until we see significant levels of vaccination worldwide. You know, the Delta variant came out of a population in, in where they were not vaccinated and the, vari- the virus was allowed to mutate. Every time a person gets sick with the virus, the m- virus has a chance to mutate. And it is, it is basically a survival mode for this virus. So as we come up with therapies and as we get people vaccinated, it is going to look for anybody who's not vaccinated to mutate. And remember, we name these variants with the Greek alphabet somewhere between Delta and Lambda. There were variants in between. They just did not come to the level of uh, uh, scrutiny by the World Health Organization. But from Lambda on to Zeta, there's still a lot of Greek, out, uh, Greek letters left, and we're going to see more variants, and every variant is going to get worse. So the Delta infects people more readily than the original coronavirus did. The next one beyond it could be even worse. And so until we are ready to vaccinate the world as a whole, uh, we're, we're going to continue to see these waves. I don't want to be saying doomsday or dystopian logic, but people have got to realize that being vaccinated is the only way we're going to get these variants under some level of control. Yes, it's bad, but it it could be so much worse. But you also have to a layer of truth over that. And that is that our medical systems are so much better. You know, we didn't have ICUs and ventilators and ECMOs and things that would sustain life like they did. uh, Now they did not have those in 1918. So our medical practice allows us to save people who would have died. And that, that's part, part of it is we're not seeing the death toll because we have the medical science and the capability to save people who would have died. But the reality is the, the virulence of the Spanish flu and how bad that was could be knocking at our door with the next variant. We just don't know. And, and of course, this was the kind of stuff you dealt with throughout your career in these labs was testing this stuff and figuring out where it was going. And then I'm sure pathology and everything else. I mean, this is, this really was your wheelhouse. Well, at the, at the beginning of my career, when I first entered into the, into the laboratory as a bench technologist was the beginning of the HIV outbreak. So, you know, I, I cut my teeth basically in clinical laboratory medicine going through the HIV um, pandemic it, it basically was a pandemic. It was in many countries. We didn't understand what that virus was and what, how it was affecting people when it was first identified. You know, and now we have therapies that allow people who are infected with HIV you know, to live long and, and productive lives. But back then, people were dying right and left. And now, as you've journeyed on into retirement... You've just sort of closed the door, which I think, you know, well, after hearing you, all man, of that, I, I mean, it makes me want to just go close the door and, and, and start reading some of your books. So, Well, Matt, I have to tell you that a number of my friends have said with the number of years that I've had experience in the clinical medicine arena, why am I not writing medical mysteries? And I said, that was then. That's not now. Yeah. Well, if you want to read some of 
Dr. Elise Wheeler's work. You can find it at the foxhavenchronicles.com. You can also go to carrolltonwritersguild.org and read about her incredible life. These are the stories. These are the stories that I love. Elise, thanks for coming on and sharing oh, yours. And- Just a little bit of yours. We didn't even get into the Native Plant Society and the, you know, the all the other stuff that you do. We'll have to have you back. I would love to do it, Matt. It's been great. All right. Dr. Elise Wheeler, you can check her books out again at foxhavenchronicles.com. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. This has been History Worth Saving. So long for now. 